It's in studio with the Hall of Famer, Matt Miller. Matty, welcome back. Good to be back. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Nowhere I'd rather be. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? What a crew. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> because when you go home, you have to decorate. And that's why this is the only place you're going to be. <laughs> I don't have to decorate. It's a privilege to decorate. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, if you're listening. He savaged that one. And also hanging out with us for, for another segment or as long as he wants to, the uh, mayor of the city of Martinsburg, Kevin Knuckles knows you. Uh, good to be here. Good to see you, lad. <laughs> good to be here. Good to have you. So your, your presence is by request, not just mine, oh. by the way. But uh, by our next guest, he is the state auditor, J.B. McCoskey, candidate for attorney general as well. J.B., good morning to you. What's up, guys? How you doing, Mayor? I'm good. How you doing? Hey, first, let, I'm going to stop everybody right now. I want to thank you on behalf, of, on behalf of municipalities in the state of West Virginia for the work that you've done. You've, you've brought some cities back to life, uh, what you've done uh, in your office to be able to help with the city of Logan and, and Wheeling and, and other cities. Uh, you should be commended. So thank you for all your help on that. Hey, you, Kevin, it, it's easy work when we have great people like you. I, I truly appreciate that shout out. It is uh, our cities are, are one of the most important things we got going for us here. Um, when people start moving home, uh, they're going to be looking to our municipalities to provide them the sort of lifestyle um, that they're accustomed to. And we've got a lot of really great mayors who are keeping themselves small and, and true to their their histories, but but starting to make sure that new young families have all the sort of creature comforts that they maybe came to enjoy somewhere else, and, and they're making their pilgrimage back. John Gilstrap, let me tell you, it is a pleasure to be co-hosting with you and such great authors as yourself. Matt Miller, as a former sportscaster and radio man and now working for the FCA, it's a pleasure working with you and all the great work that you've been do getting I, done. I too. enjoy the way you've kept yourself hey, humble, Rob. And <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of backslapping going on here between the two of you. Is that why you wanted yeah. Knuckles to stay on with you? <laughs> well, it's one of the reasons, but I, I presume on Monday mornings everyone just sits around and talks about how bad they feel and how much they hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Monday show, yeah, I think it's pretty accurate. Yeah, Tuesday, yeah. Monday? Tuesday, Monday. Tuesday. Is when we all make repentance uh, and and are nice to to our fellow man. Yeah, I have to ask Tuesday. I have to ask a question though. What what does an state auditor do that saves cities? Uh, well, a, a, a myriad of things. Uh, so I was probably got to be the auditor during the most tumultuous time for municipal governments in history when you go through the pandemic and. Uh, the losses of revenue and, and the inability to, to staff the office. And uh, we have police shortages. But, but mostly what my office has, has tried to do is to be the central hub for information and resources for local governments so that they can um, make sure that they are moving forward confidently. One of the things that I found when I started is that a lot of these municipalities had these grand ideas and, and plans to revitalize themselves um, but there were grants that they had to apply for and there were federal guidelines with regard to funding that they received and there was a, a bit of a, a paralysis in action because of uh, either a lack of understanding or being scared of uh, missing a, a, a T or not, not dotting an I and so we spent an enormous amount of our time working with cities to make sure that they can confidently work on the projects that they're trying to work on. Uh, the other things that we do, um, well, uh, one thing that we did in, in particular is, is working with the, the state Senate and at a lot of other municipal leaders. We created a, a dilapidated building project, uh, and to date we've, we've had $30 million appropriated to tear down bad buildings uh, and to help municipalities purchase tax delinquent properties and then use this funding to tear down the buildings that are, are making cities um, less attractive to, to new people. And with these buildings coming down, um, you know, we have room for development. We have safer cities, less, less uh, fires, uh, less danger for our, our first responders. And um, just sort of a feeling of revitalization can be really infectious. Uh, and then lastly, we protect them uh, from fraud. And so there is, you know, our office, unfortunately, has uh, prosecuted to felony conviction, an enormous amount of fraud in the state of West Virginia. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that comes out of our, our municipalities. And so uh, we provide a lot of resources for our municipalities when they when they notice this fraud and, and we help them uh, remove these these bad actors from their from their governments. And we had a case like that locally 
Uh, JB, how much involvement does your office have in regards to the embezzlement case in the clerk's office in Berkeley County? Rob, did you like that softball I just tossed you? I did. <laughs> Actually, as a matter of fact, I was going to pat you on the back like Kevin started the segment by saying, as It is one ball. of the Throws. finest softballs ever thrown. <laughs> Gorgeous looking hard boiled egg there. Not only am I the state auditor and attorney general's candidate, but I am a segue creator for radio content. Um, Love it. The. <laughs> So, so the case in, in out there in Berkeley County is is something that our office was intimately involved with. Uh, I can't get into a ton of detail about it simply because it's still in process. Uh, but that was a case that we were alerted to by the new clerk, and uh, there was a very small amount of uh, the allegations really involved more mis not necessarily fraud, but maybe just. Uh, a, a lack of in, internal controls. Uh, and when we got to the site and started working through the records, uh, we found a, a fairly sophisticated and large scale fraud. Uh, and we were able to work with law enforcement in the area and, and very importantly with the prosecutor there. Um, and that's something that we do in all of these cases is, is the local prosecutor leads these things. And we are a support staff, and, and when prosecutors ask us uh, to act as prosecutor, we are always more than happy to do that. But um, in, in the fraud world, uh, we are the people that find the fraud, and we are the people that build the record uh, so that our local prosecutors can, can be successful. Uh, and in this case, that's what happened. And I believe it's a 42-count uh, a indictment uh, with somewhere in the neighborhood of $140,000 uh, that we believe or, or has been alleged to have been stolen. Yeah, and, and some say that it, it could even be more than that, JB. Is that figure final, or is it possible you could even be discovering more money? Yeah, I, I, I can't really comment on that. Um, you know, it, that in every single case, uh, especially when it pertains to people who have been clandestinely um, stealing money, there's always a, a pretty good chance that you haven't found all of it yet. And one of the ways that uh, our office proceeds in these cases is that um, we continue to work with, with alleged victims or, uh, and alleged uh, perpetrators throughout the indictment process um, as things become more clear about the sort of the judicial resolution of what's going on, people become more forthright uh, in their admissions. Okay. And that doesn't happen every time, but... But that, that's the reason why we, we steadfastly stay with uh, alleged perpetrators through the, the entirety of the, of the process. I want to talk to you about Ryan Weld's decision to drop out of the race for attorney general, leaving you and Mike Stewart as the two main candidates who are uh, left uh, in, in the upcoming primary. Uh, JB, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so Ryan's a great guy. And, and him going back to the Senate uh, is a good thing for West Virginia. It's a good thing for the, the process of legislation. And, um, you know, I'm really excited about what the legislature is going to be doing uh, in the next session. Uh, and now it's, it's, a, it's a two-man race with me and Mike, and I'm really excited about how my campaign's going. Uh, I'm really excited about the, the support that we have received over the last four or five months, uh, both financially and um, just in general, right? I mean, there's been a, a, an outpouring of of support for this candidacy that it was uh, surprised me even. And so, you know, we've been in every single county multiple times. We have incredible relationships with our local officials, and um, and we have a record uh, in the auditor's office that is pretty extraordinary, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to sharing that message and my vision for West Virginia with, with every single West Virginian. Mike Stewart said that you and Weld were fairly similar ideologically in terms of positions on things, but that the more qualified of the two of you has now dropped out. What did you think of that statement? Yeah, so I like to um, campaign for uh, the people of West Virginia. It, it is my mission to tell every West Virginian um, what an incredible future we have in front of us and to lay out a vision for how we can achieve that. And, and it's hard to do that when you talk about other people. So, you know, I, I try really hard in my campaign uh, to, to stick to, to my vision, which, um, you know, in the auditor's office has uh, returned over $100 million back to the general revenue. We have added 900 audits to our list. Our audit process is 3,000% faster. Uh, and we've done all this while 
indicting and convicting 42 uh, felony perpetrators and, you know, completely reforming Oasis and, and doing just a myriad of other things that have truly benefited the government. Uh, but what's really important about that is that we've made our office 25 percent smaller in our general revenue appropriation and 20 percent smaller uh, in the amount of people that work for us. And so as we move forward as a state, I think what's really important is finding leaders who have uh, not just a vision, but a, a record of achieving results um, and making our government smaller while providing better, uh, better government to the people is going to be our next great challenge. And I am really excited about working with the next governor to uh, make our government smaller, but also refocus ourselves on the things that must get done. And that's educating our ch children, building great infrastructure that prepares localities for investment, uh, and uh, importantly, helps to make sure that we're taking care of people that, that cannot take care of themselves. And in all three of those areas, there is so much work we can do, and I don't believe that spending more money uh, is the answer to that question. And I am so excited about uh, my record on, on all of those things and, and the attorney general's ability to help the governor make that a reality. John Gilstrap. JB, I don't know if you heard the um, the opener here at the top of the hour, but among the reasons that uh, Senator Weld mentioned for suspending his campaign was that he did not want to compromise his principles and he didn't want to compromise who he was for the sake of chasing down campaign donors. Does that resonate with you as as a problem within the system? Um, that's an interesting question. Is it a problem? So so here's the question that we have to ask ourselves just as in, in, a, in a large scale, right, is what should be the individual person or the individual business owner's right with their own money to influence uh, the, the electoral process? And I think in this country, when you consider the way that our First Amendment is written, uh, we need to be given large latitude to individual freedom as it relates to how, um, to how people can support or enable candidates to spread their message. I think with all of that being said, there is a – I've gotten to the point where politicians uh, often now see this as an opportunity to be famous as opposed to be effective. And I think a lot of that is driven by social media and by media spending and uh, in part by the media itself being drawn to characters who bring listeners and viewers. And so I think – we have to be very, very careful to respect the rights of individual citizens uh, to speak through the electoral process. But I think if we were able to, as a, as a country and as a society, start to get back to the ideals of service um, and, and, and serving through government, as opposed to using government as a platform to get followers on social media or ears and eyes onto TVs, I think we would do a lot better. Um, and so I think there's sort of competing issues there. Uh, but I think the most important one is we have to be very, very careful uh, to ensure that, that, that people in this country are given the right to support their candidates in the ways that they choose. Do you find yourself in a position as you're raising significant funds for a statewide office to uh, to make promises or to um, consider points of view or consider positions, I guess, that you otherwise would not? Because I, th I think that was what the the underpinnings of Senator Weld's concerns were. I don't find that. Um, you know, there are people that give me money that I don't agree with all the time. Um, but when I speak to people who, who are excited about my campaign, that we might not share ideologies uh, as far as politics go, um, Usually what they'll tell me is that they respect my work and they respect my, my moral compass, and, and they're hopeful um, that my attorney general's office uh, will reflect those. And I think it's really, really important that all of us start to get back to having conversations and relationships with people that we don't agree with. One of the biggest problems that we have in politics is that we have become so insular uh, in our circles of influence that we, we infrequently find outside views that may challenge what we already think. 
And, you know, one of the things that, that I have found in, in my 42 years on this earth is that the answers to the biggest problems are almost never solved when a bunch of people who agree get together. The answers to the biggest problems are found when people who have differing viewpoints are able to, um, to look at each other and say, look, I disagree with you on this, but I think this is a way we can make your solution better, and vice versa, without uh, a screaming match ensuing. And so, you know, I, I have spent a lot of my um, – so for me, that is, that is part of this entire process, is that once you win, uh, you are everybody's attorney general. And I think that's an important thing for everybody to remember. Matt Miller. Uh, JB, uh, let, let's go into uh, the idea of the transition from the auditor's office to the AG's office. If you are able to win this race and to have that position, do you see that as a natural transition with some of the things that you do right now as an auditor to what you will do as an attorney general? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the really interesting things about the auditor's office is that it involves a whole lot of, of legal analysis and and. Uh, the practice of law. And so I spend pretty much my entire day analyzing the state code and and determining whether or not expenses and or actions uh, are legal and or appropriate uh, pursuant to the law, which is, you know, it, it just is what we do. We also are what's called the securities commissioner. So we enforce and, and regulate all of the state securities laws. Um, and almost all of that duty within our office involves the practice of law. Uh, and then we're also the land commissioner. And so what we're doing uh, in the land commissioner's role is, number one, working with cities and, and localities to help them tear down bad buildings. But we are overseeing the sale um, of tax delinquent property and managing deeds and managing uh, title searches and ensuring that uh, proper notice has been provided to owners. And, and almost that entire role involves the practice of law as well. Um, and so then when you get down to the other thing that we do, which is, is work and manage state contracts, which is another uh, one of the attorney general's major roles, you know, we spend basically our entire day uh, merging the ideas of accounting and law together uh, to make sure that the state is following its own code in its spending practices, um, along with, uh, you know, the, the, the securities and the land division. On top of that, um, you know, managing a large scale uh, state bureaucracy. And, you know, we have about 200 employees in my office and, and making sure that, that my employees have the resources that they need, that we understand what employees are uh, sick or having a baby or, or uh, you know, uh, having an anniversary trip or whatever it is, managing a, a really large group of people that all have a massively important role in how the state's uh, success is going to be for not just that week or that day, but that year, um, is a difficult task. And so when you move into the attorney general's office, you have to take all of the things that you've learned in managing that large scale group and bring it over to the attorney general's office. And I think one of the things that's really, really important for, for everybody to understand is that Patrick Morrissey changed the way that that office works in a way that no one in West Virginia history probably has. Right. The, the attorney general's office in West Virginia is, is more successful now than it's ever been. And so there's a, a really great footprint and a really great blueprint uh, for me to go into that office and start to, to really utilize the successes that Patrick has seen uh, and created and then put my own uh, put my own sort of spin on things. And so I'm really, really excited about that opportunity. And I do think um, that having served in the state auditor's role is is a really great window into the entirety of our state government and will make me a much more effective attorney general than I would have been otherwise. You mentioned earlier three keys, uh, education, investment, caring for people within the state. Uh, how do you see the AG's office being able to help support those initiatives and, and as you mentioned earlier, support uh, who the, the new governor will be uh, that, that you would serve under in that role? Yeah, so... The, the, the hope is, is that the next governor is going to share this vision that I have. That is, the state government needs to both refocus on those three specific things and become markedly more effective at creating those outcomes for the citizens of West Virginia. And while doing so, it has to be done in a way that is 
we can't just say these problems aren't being solved because we don't spend enough money, right? If that's your answer, that's the answer we've tried to have for the last 80 years, and it isn't working. The answer is, is we have to find out why we aren't being successful and solve for that as opposed to simply throwing money at problems. And the way that the attorney general can be intensely uh, and, and, and ingrained in that process is that in any organization, whenever you are trying to reorganize the entirety of what you're doing, the people in the CEO, the general counsel, and the CFO. And so what I believe is, is we are going to build a team of people uh, in the next administration where the Board of Public Works works seamlessly together, and the attorney general is going to have to be right there next to the governor, making sure that um, all of the uh, intricacies of, 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 of how this change is happening are being reviewed by the state's lawyer. And while it is important for the attorney general to sue the federal government to make sure that people um, have the rights that are absolutely guaranteed to them in the Constitution, the number one role of the, of the attorney general in West Virginia is to be the state's lawyer. Uh, and to be the, what is, in a sense, the state's general counsel. And so um, I am very, very excited about uh, melding my vision uh, of that with the next governors. J.B. McCuskey has been our guest in this half hour. Kevin, a final thought to J.B. before he goes. Well, J.B., I know that the, the, the uh, footprint has been set as far as the opioid settlements for the out of the attorney general's office. And, you know, it's just my hopes that uh, if you were to become uh, attorney general, that you continue to carry on uh, the anything, any of the litigation that may or may not be taking place for the opioid settlements for the state of West Virginia. Yeah, I think our next, Kevin, thank you so much. Our next great challenge is to, um, is to help local governments use this money in a way that is effective, right? We're going to get one chance with this billion dollars to make sure this problem doesn't happen again. There, there are two, two things we're solving for. And, and to me, the most important of them is what can we do to use this billion dollars to make sure we're not in the same position we are now in 10 years? We cannot ever move forward as long as we are being burdened both financially and from a population standpoint by this opioid crisis. And so this money needs to be uh, specifically uh, and intentionally spent to ensure that this generation of kids, you know, I've got a six and an eight year old. So I see this every day, right? These kids need to avoid this incredibly destructive pattern that our state has been in. And I think we have a real opportunity with this funding and working with our local governments to make finally uh, that a reality. JB, thanks so much for your time. If you have a final thought, this would be a great time to give it. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, my final thought is, is I, I just truly appreciate you guys having me on. I love being out in the Eastern Panhandle um, and for and, and getting back to, to just sort of the fraud uh, indictment that we talked about earlier. Use the transparency tools at your disposal. The counties out there use it. Um, the, 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 the transactions are online. Use them to help us fight fraud. But more importantly, use the we have made West Virginia the most transparent state in the entire United States. And the reason we did that is so that voters can be informed when they go to the ballot box. We're getting very close to Election Day. And my hope is, is that every single person in West Virginia will walk into that voting booth with a confident understanding of who and why they're voting for who and why they're voting for. JB, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a wonderful day. You too.